So good evening, everyone. And it's our great pleasure to welcome you to the first EPUS web conference. And we're truly honored to have Professor Dr. Mohammed Seda, the president of uh, the society with us. Welcome, Dr. Mohammed. Hello. Well, uh, I am Dr. Seda. Uh, I am the president of the Egyptian uh, Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Society. Uh, a society that was founded 14 years ago, and it is actually uh, the only society in the Middle East and Africa that deals with pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus problems. Um, I would like to thank all the attendees that are going to participate with us, as well as I thank uh, absolutely uh, Professor Oskan from Turkey, who is one of the panelists today, and she is very well uh, known and famous person in this field, an ex-president of the ESA, the European Society, and an ex-president of the ISA, the International Society of Strabismus and Ophthalmology. And I would like as well to thank our colleagues here uh, from uh, Cairo, Egypt, and Alexandria, Egypt, who are participating with us uh, tonight and hopefully it will be an, a successful uh, reunion. Uh, Eva Pharma are uh, the company that are sponsoring this meeting. I would like to thank them uh, very much for their uh, contribution. And I leave you now with the moderators, uh, Dr. Ayman El Ghanemi and Dr. Dina Hussam uh, to introduce the panelists and to uh, start this event. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Dr. Mohammed. We are okay. honored to have Professor Dr. Hal Al Hilali, Cairo University, Professor Dr. Ahmed Rez, Research Institute, Professor Dr. Mustafa Sherbini, the Assistant Professor Dr. Amr Kamshushi, Alexandria University, and my colleague, my dear colleague, Dr. Ayman Al Ghunaymi. So, Dr. Ayman, hi. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, Dina. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Mohammed Saida and uh, uh, would like to thank all the panelists. Um, okay, for this night, we will have a, a interesting case presentations. We have four cases to discuss, three strabismus cases and one case, a pediatric anterior segment. And uh, I'm sure the panelists will enrich the, uh, the discussion. Uh, and I'd like to welcome all the audience. I'm assuring that you will find an interesting discussion uh, for this night. Uh, I'm asking the audience we, uh, that Please share your, your experience with us. We have uh, two ways for this. Uh, we will uh, launch uh, polls during the, uh, the presentations. So please share our poll when it appears. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a, um, a button called Q&A, which means for questions and answers. If you have any question about any case for the panelists, please uh, post it in the Q&A, and we will collect it and ask it to the panelists uh, for discussion at the end of each case, okay? So if you all are ready, uh, we can start the first case. Let's start it. Okay. So we'll start for, the, for case one. If you are all ready, let's start it. Well, uh, the first case, uh, this 10 years old boy uh, came complaining of inward deviation. The mother complained that uh, she noticed a child having inward eye deviation. She started noticing actually like a week ago. She sought medical advice and told that her child had, uh, uh, the child has accommodative esotropia and the patient were prescribed glasses, but she didn't do the glasses uh, because she is not interested in this. The patient has no significant uh, uh, systemic. The mother was not happy for this and she's asking for, she came for a second opinion if we have any other option other than having glass. On examination, the vision was 6-9, and 612, the anterior segment was free, the pupils normal, and this is the ocular motility of the child. Uh, I'm showing this the horizontal movement. You can see, you can see here a small, a small angle isotropy, as you can see, and here is the horizontal movement. So, here is the picture. This is a primary position, and right gaze and left gaze. After the patient received psychoplegic uh, drops, this is the psychoplegic refraction of the patient and the fundi were normal. So audience, 
please be ready for the first poll. Share with us, if you face a case like this, what could be the, your first choice? Case of esotropia and hypermetropia. So what's next? So please, if you can, launch the, the first poll and please uh, put on your answer. Would you prescribe full sacrificial refraction? Would you prescribe glasses, but you uh, decrease the plus? Would you continue for orthoptic evaluation? I mean, measuring the angle of deviation in other positions? Or would you prescribe no glasses and just nothing more can be done? Or you have something else in your mind? So please vote, please. Everyone in the audience, please vote. Choose one of the five options. I will leave you up for uh, more uh, five minutes, five seconds more. <clears throat> Okay, let's see the results. Well, interestingly, 48% choose the first one. Okay, let me, let me share with, the, with, the, with my panelists uh, with, what's your opinion about the, the, uh, the findings now. Let me ask Dr. Mustafa. Dr. Mustafa, are you? Uh, yes. uh, uh, what's your opinion about the, if it's anything, anything significant in the history? Uh, or in the video you'd like to comment about, and what's, what do you think about this results of the poll? Well, of course, with the video, you cannot see much of this uh, eye movement problem, I mean the isotropia, but uh, we have to proceed first for the total orthoptic evaluation or, or muscle sure. evaluation. Sure. And then it's amazing that he's still amblyopic, slightly left eye. Uh, how about uh, with subjective refraction, does he improve with the vision? And then we can proceed from there and see what's going on. But people saying, giving glasses, it's very classic to say this. 48% uh, suggest to give glasses yes. with. But you, with have to, you have to do all the examination first, and then you can start giving the glasses if you want. OK. So let's, let's proceed for the more data for, from the patient. As you, as you uh, mentioned to Mustafa, we have psychopathic uh, refraction. We have to do uh, the optic uh, evaluation, uh, measuring the angle of deviation. Let's see the measurements. When we put the prism on the right, we have the isotropia of 35 prism diopters. However, when we put the prism on the left, we have isotropia of 25 prism diopters. And for me, we found an isotropia of 14 prism diopters. And here are the measurements inside gazes and other gaze. There's no significant pattern, but you can see in the right gaze it's 14 prism diopters and in the left gaze it is uh, 35 prism diopters. So my question to the audience, interestingly, we have a patient with this. So let me ask Dr. Akmal. Dr. Akmal, would you like to have a comment about this measurements? Yes. It's interesting. First of all, we have an incompetence toward the left, the left eye, even it is not uh, apparent with the motility. And the, the second thing, it's interesting that the angle at far is more than angle at mid. And yes. this is not happen if there is only, the only cause is a sixth nerve paresis. And the sixth nerve paresis is not uh, affected by all the fibers. I think the fibers, which is the uh, slow tonic fibers is only affected, not the fast saccadic fibers, because the motility is normal. And this is only happened with any, uh, the vascular insult or a long standing six nerve paralysis. It's not a long standing. I don't, I, I, I astonish that it is the recent. Yeah, they they yes. noticed it like a week ago, interesting. It's very in interesting. It, it's, mm -hmm. Almost happens in old ages. And why is the angle at near is less than angle at far? Because at near we need only convergence. Yes. Not, we don't need any uh, action of the lateral rectus. So you mean that it means that we have something in the, in the divergence, right? Yes, and I don't believe in divergence. We don't need any divergence. But on okay. looking far, we need the relaxation of convergence and leaving the balance of the tone at far. The balance of the tone is weak, so the angle will be more at far because the slow tonic fibers is affected. But on motility, 
the saccadic fibers, the fast saccadic fibers is good. So this is the explanation of the angle at far more than angle at near. Interesting. You want me to show the video again for you? Okay. Hmm. Okay, Dr. Scan, do you have any comments about this uh, measurement? Well, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Akmal's uh, idea. And uh, I think this is a clear cut six nerve left six nerve palsy. So the uh, motility restriction, uh, it's not surprising not to see any motility restriction because it is so common that if the palsy is not a total palsy, but it is a partial palsy or as you call it as paresis, then uh, it's not uncommon not to see anything in eye movements. So that's the reason why uh, we as ophthalmologists recognize uh, more uh, paretic problems compared to neurologists because yes. just looking to the ocular movements is the way of the examination of neurologists. But as yes. ophthalmologists, yes. what we do is we need to do uh, prism cover test in all nine positions of gaze. In any case who had the sudden onset uh, strabismus or any diplopia, either a child or uh, an adult. So this is a, a basic rule, I suppose. So okay, we need okay. to continue as a six nerve palsy uh, for this child. So let me ask you a question. If you look at this motility, you can see now by, by the moving video that the, the, lim, the, the left gaze, there is some limitation of abduction. So you based your diagnosis as six nerve based on this motility or on the measurements that we- On the prism cover test. It's uh, the golden standard method is the prism cover test because even in, in a lesser degree of six nerve palsy, uh, you may see even a uh, less degree of pre uh, measurements in uh, prism cover tests uh, in with, but uh, with the six nerve paresis, paresis diagnosis. Okay. So uh, my, uh, in, in partial ones, my uh, diagnosis is totally based upon the prism cover test measurements. And even in children, it's very easy to go ahead because I do it by just covering the head of the patient while looking far. Okay, okay. That's great. Okay, Let, let's move to the next question. And so we issue that we have a suspicion, of, almost we are uh, confident that we have uh, like left six nerve uh, palsy. So the question is, is, and when you face a, a, a case uh, like this, um, who, uh, what ca the cases you will wish to order MRI in such in case of strabismus? Let me ask the audience: uh, Would you order case of MRI, uh, MRI in which of the following uh, cases? Uh, number well, the first option: acute incompetent strabismus. When you face acute incompetent strabismus, or you face a case with acute concomitant strabismus. Let's say. That measurements were committent, but it's an acute onset. Uh, would, would, you, uh, would you do uh, all the MRI? Or number three, if every case of acute uh, onset uh, concomitant uh, strabismus, or never in case of concomitant strabismus, you don't, uh, you don't order MRI for cases of competent strabismus. So please share your opinion in the audience for uh, this. Which of those cases you order MRI brain? Acute incompetent strabismus, acute Cometan, strabismus only if we have distance more than near. Every case of acute onset cometan strabismus, we never uh, request MRI in case of cometan strabismus. So please, uh, the audience share, please. Okay, thank you. So, okay, let's let me ask Dr. Hala. Dr. Yes. Hala, what? Yeah, Professor Hala, what what do you think about the results? Sixty-five percent said that every case of acute incompetent <laughs> strabismus, they will order uh, MRI. So, what do you think about the results? Interesting. And then twenty-six percent said that every case of acute onset cometan strabismus, they will order MRI. Uh, do, you, do you agree on, the, on this? Actually, uh, I prefer to be uh, um, more cautious than being sorry. And that is why if I have an onset uh, of strabismus that is 
an acute onset, and I don't find the refraction uh, the overly uh, hypermetropic to explain that this is an accommodative ET. I would rather be safe than sorry. Uh, and even if it's a comitant deviation, because even um, some kids are very, uh, uh, are too young to get really good measurements on. And as you said, sometimes the, uh, the limitation of abduction is, uh, can pass an unnoticed in motility exam. So I would rather uh, get an MRI on any acute case of uh, uh, acute onset uh, comet, even if it's a comitant deviation. And definitely, if you have a distant near uh, uh, disparity, I would definitely get an MRI on, on, on that person. Okay. So you do, you, you, you do and request MRI for every case of acute onset strabismus, even for competent strabismus, right? If, if, it, uh, if that case, uh, I cannot explain it as an accommodative uh, isotrope. Uh, if it's not a high hypermetropic patient, like your patient from the start, it's not someone that I would, uh, I would prescribe glasses and think that the deviation would be corrected by that kind of refraction. Okay. So I would, be, I would have a high index of suspicion for someone like that. Okay. Let me ask you, Tram. Tram. And regarding the same, you regarding the same point, for every case of uh, acute uh, strabismus, even if it is concomitant. Well, I, I wish the answer was that simple because um, you have to play two fact, two factors coming to play here. Uh, first, you have to take into consideration what exactly is acute. It's not always easy to know if the if the onset is acute or not. If you because you depend on history and this, and if you're talking about a young child who's one years old or two years old, you may not get such a clear history from the from the from the parents. Um, second, age comes into play here. Uh, this child is 10 years old. So yes. if I have a new onset strabismus with diplopia in a child who's 10 or a 9 or an 8 or even a 7 years old, I would order an MRI, whether it's committent, whether it's incommitant, any form of MRI that cannot be explained by local changes in the eye would definitely order an MRI. But um, the answer is different if you're talking about a younger child. Uh, if you have a 1-year-old or, um, or a 2-years-old, it's not unusual to see strabismus that starts at that age and uh, uh, we would not, not explain, I'm talking about strabismus not explained by hypermetropic refractive error. And um, the history is rather acute and still I would not have a high index of suspicion. And in that age, the younger age, let's say younger than three or younger than two, I have to see some incompetence in order to, uh, to, to order an MRI. Um, there is, there's no clear cut point. I can't say like a specific age beyond which we order MRI. But I would say that the older the child is, I'd be more and more inclined to order an MRI, um, even if it's committent. And uh, neurological diseases can present as acute committent isotopia. Interesting. So Mustafa, you'd like to, uh, and what, what, what do you do when, when you order an MRI for, for suicide or if you have any comments about? Uh... Well, I totally agree with what my colleague said, but I uh, only want to mention here that we, when we're talking about, like Dr. Amr said, about the age group. I mean, now we are talking about really uh, early age group. And um, because older age group, we think about vascular insufficiency. I mean, the old age. But this young age group, we are not dealing, except if we think sometimes about idiopathic ones, which happen to be maybe 20, 25% of the cases. That's what the literature said. So we normally, as I, I didn't really, uh, uh, thought about, but when I, I read about it more, I found it really at this early age, when you have acute non-traumatic six nerves, you have to think about something going on in the brain. I mean, something like tumor or anything happening uh, at this age, because it's really very frequent. And as Dr. Hella said, it's better to be worried and safe than to be uh, to leave it like this but there is something i want to mention here that you you said diplopia uh, in this age when things happen very fast you'll find the kid coming and really blurred and uh, yeah, yeah. he can but tell you there is something wrong point, but this it? situation in this case you said you didn't say this so it means and be progressive because he didn't really Notice it, notice it as, as much as a sudden attack. 
Yeah, that's Interesting. what I want to It was not the main complaint of, of the patient. Actually, when I forced him, I asked him several times about double vision. He said, sometimes on the left gaze, I can see things blurred, but it was not an, the obvious diplopia that we usually see in acute, ons, in acute six nerve pulse. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I mean, vision, normally when, when cases are coming with acute onset, even in, in, in a child after the, the age of eight years, nine years, they really mention it directly. And we know normally, People, even old age, whenever they don't really mention the diplopia, so it's something going on for a while, and they did sort of adapt, adapting themselves to it. And this is not the case here. Okay. Uh, Turakman, you have uh, something to comment? Turakman? Yes. It's amazing that if it is acute onset, the child should come with uh, head posture, abnormal head posture. So it is a very old uh, history. Uh, the most common cause in this age is a non-localizing or it is a benign increased intracranial tension. This is the first thing I, will, I, I suspect and I should see the fundus first. And if I uh, examine the fundus and I see papyridema, so I determine if I, I ask for MRI for tumor or for a benign increased intracranial tension for medical treatment or something like that. But for the features I, yeah, I, mean, I am dealing with, it's not that acute because there's no head posture. Okay. Any young child, 10 years old, even he, he uh, complain of uh, diplopia or he has uh, head posture, normal head posture to the right. Interesting. And from the scan, people, you know, she has any uh, abnormal head posture. Yeah, it, 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 there is no say uh, to push it. But we should ask for the scanning. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, Dr. Oskan, you want to add something? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, for this child, as I mentioned, uh, I would go on uh, uh, accepting this child as a six nerve palsy. But regarding the poll question, if we consider about um, asking an MRI and so on, if it is an incomitant strabismus, as I believe in this child. Uh, at any age, I would ask for an MRI. But uh, if it, it would be an acute con concomitant esotropia, so uh, this is another issue. As, uh, as it is mentioned, so we mustn't give the message that all acquired esotropias require MRI. So we know that it's a very common situation, uh, acquired isotropia at two or three years of age, it is very common and we don't ask for MRI. But there's a gray zone that we don't have a very clear cut age group, but I think it wouldn't be so wrong if we say that the age uh, group enough to uh, talk about diplopia are the ones who actually require MRI. But on the other hand, the, the only small thing that I want, I wish to add is acute concomitant isotropia was a rare problem in the previous years, but in recently it became uh, a common problem. And so this is mainly as on screen uh, basis a problem. So those children who spend lots of time with mobiles and the computers, then they start to become with, uh, come with the diplopia and acute committant isotropia. We started to see it uh, much more common compared to previous years. And I just wanted to mention this, but despite this uh, recent problem, uh, 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 in, in an age group who has um, who uh, complain about diplopia, I always yeah. ask for an MRI in a concomitant acquired isotropia. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Hella, you want to add something? Uh, I just yes. wanted to add something uh, very briefly. Uh, yes, definitely, looking at the disc is important, but also uh, trying to see if there's any nystagmus that the patient has. If the patient has gaze evoked nystagmus or a, um, a down beating, uh, an interesting thing of is the Arnold Chiari malformation because that also results in uh, an angle that is at distance um, bigger than a near, an isotropia that is more at distance than near, and, and sometimes that's something that is missed. Yeah, that's, that's good. There's a question just from the audience. Is there any small left hypertropia in the right gaze, Dr. Ayman? Was there yeah, any small vertical deviation? I think it was not, yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so let me show you the MRI. This is what I requested the MRI. This patient we requested the MRI, and the MRI showed a significant supracellular uh, lesion. It was quite big. It's like 3.5 centimeters by 5.5. Uh, so this patient was referred to an oncologist and the biopsy has showed an astrocytoma and then the patient is receiving chemotherapy now. So to conclude this thing, I would I'd like to ask the, the, uh, every panelist to have a very short one sentence take home message for the audiences in such case. Dr. Ackman, please. Yes. Any acute incompetence, especially incompetent strabismus, we should uh, see the fundus and do neuroimaging. And I agree with Dr. Uh, um, that there is a high percentage of acute concomitant strabismus with a neurological problem. So some uh, yeah, advanced countries, they do this neuroimaging even for uh, all acute strabismus. Okay. 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 Thank you. Dr. Mustafa, should you uh, one sentence uh, as a take home message to the uh, audience? Well, I totally agree with Dr. Akmal. I just wanted to say this acute strabismus as we said for neuroimaging, uh, I want to mention also that even in old age that we think it's vascular, but I found out by literature that there is a big number that comes from even uh, some tumor or something like this, even, it's, even in diabetic patient or hypertensive. So you have to keep in mind that we have to worry about these acute problems. Okay, Dr. Hella, you have a last... Uh, I'm fine. No, I'm good. Dr. Okay, Scan, can you uh, give us the, the last uh, message from this uh, patient? Well, there are a few messages, but I think I've already uh, said it. The first is prism, prism cover test measurement in nine positions of gaze. And second, the um, acute competent isotropia in an old child. And third is uh, incompetent strabismus that certainly require an MRI scan, and also acute competent strabismus in an old, old, old child uh, certainly requires an MRI imaging, I suppose. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dina. Can you uh, check if you have any questions from the audience? Uh, we can take one question from the audience. All the questions answered. Just uh, it, it has been asked several times. The, the, the child doesn't complain of any double vision, so I think it's just at yes, the side gaze. Yes, it's a very weird for this patient. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting uh, discussion. I learned a lot from uh, from you, and I hope the audience enjoyed this uh, discussion. Thank you very much for this. And uh, let's uh, move to the uh, second case, an anterior segment, uh, pediatric uh, case. So, uh, my colleague uh, Trudina will start. Uh, uh, can take over from now to Tulina. Yes. Uh, okay, so I'm going to start my case, and this is a, a diversion uh, from strabismus surgery for a little while. Uh, I've been getting comments that uh, my voice is not very clear, so I'm sorry for the uh, quality of the internet. Uh, no, it's quite clear. It's good. Okay, yes, so I'm hoping good. also that uh, that the video uh, clip that I'm showing will run a little better than uh, when we tried it. So. Um, this is an eight-year-old girl who was completely asymptomatic, but her parents, uh, when uh, on presentation, told us that uh, when she was six years old, the only thing that they noticed was the white opacity within the pupil. And based on that, they sought uh, medical advice and they were told that uh, uh, she has a, a cataract and uh, that the uh, cataract was caused by uveitis, that she had a chronic uveitis. This led to the diagnosis of juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And when you really insist on the history, they would tell you that, uh, uh, she start, that she did have a left knee pain shortly before or around the time when they noticed the white opacity. So this is a case of uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, when, uh, which is uh, less common. Uh, the uveitis happened probably before the knee inflammation or before the joint inflammation. Uh, so she received topical and systemic anti-inflammatory medication uh, at her first uh, uh, doctor. And uh, she underwent left cataract and intraocular lens surgery in the left eye three months after starting the medication. So this is what she looked like when we first saw her. This is the right eye. She had a visual acuity of counting fingers 50 centimeters, a shallow anterior chamber, 
there was no anterior chamber activity in that eye, but you could see that there had been, there were posterior synechia, a poorly dilatable pupil, a total cataract, and their intraocular pressure was 14 millimeters mercury. This is the left eye. This is the eye that had undergone surgery, and you could see quite a lot uh, going on there. Uh, she had a visual ac acuity of hand movement with good projection of light. Uh, there was a lot of inflammation with anterior chamber cells and flare. A shallow anterior chamber and iris bombay because the uh, optic of the IUL was captured within the pupil. And it was also cocooned in a dense membrane, the, uh, the edges of the, uh, of the optic. Uh, the intraocular pressure uh, in that eye was 10 millimeters mercury. She was on medications already. She was taking topical steroids, drops daily in the right eye, four in the left. She was also on oral steroids and methotrexate uh, subcutaneous injections weekly. Still, she had an active inflammation in that eye and she was extremely photophobic. And her photophobia was really incapacitating. Uh, so I referred her to uh, our uveitis clinic uh, where uh, adalimumab was added. Uh, the biologic agent. Her uh, topical steroids were increased to six times uh, a day. Her oral steroids were also up. Uh, the activity did tone down, but was not completely suppressed. And her uveitis, the uveitis specialist advised me that the intraocular lens had to be explanted. So this is where we are going to uh, uh, our, our first poll uh, question. Uh, in cataract surgery for a juvenile uh, idiopathic arthritis, I would implant an IOL. I would never implant an IOL. I would remove the cataract now and perform secondary IOL implantation six months to a year later. That's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. So, Dina, would you like to take it from here and uh, ask the panelists uh, a few questions? Yes. So, Dr. Mustafa, what's your opinion in IOL implantation in juvenile idiopathic arthritis? Well, uh, I think that Dr. Hella mentioned in her talk that. Uh, we are talking about 10 year old. Uh, so Eight. if we see uh, the, the child very early, I think I would rather remove and leave it without IOL at the start. Uh, but if it's an uh, old child and we well uh, treated and balanced, I mean for at least six months. So I may consider putting an IOL at that moment if everything is all right. And so just you, how, how would you avoid ending up in this situation? Do you have any guarantees that it won't uh, have the same fate with optic capture and chronic inflammation not responding to treatment? Why, well, of course, of course, you, there is no guarantee, but I mean, you try to find that this child is well uh, balanced with the treatment, I mean, no inflammation, and your rheumatologist saying that for the last six months is under control and we are getting less the treatment. And at that moment, you can maybe put him under steroid before the surgery and do as me and Dr. Hella is doing, uh, putting the oil in the bag and trying to put some steroids inside and keep him well monitored. I think you may have this. And of course, cycloplegic drops like atropine is better. I mean, before and after. I mean, it's always uh, a risky situation, but we try to balance if we feel that we are well managed. But if you feel that you are not sure about this child or is very, uh, I mean, it's early in life, I mean, especially at the first two years, I mean, no, no problem, but at least at this situation, you don't put an IOL, you just leave him alone and see in, uh, in the six months or one year after. So, Dr. Hella, what do you think? Uh, okay, so I actually, I agree with the poll. I'm very happy that the poll came out this way, that I would remove the cataract now and perform secondary IOL implantation six months later. And um, so 
first of all, we've done a lot of these cases in uh, in Cairo Children's Hospital, and uh, uh, we are able now to choose the right procedure for the right patient. So for this girl, for example, uh, she developed the uveitis, an aggressive uveitis, uh, which was so aggressive that it led to a complicated cataract. And you have to note here that the complicated cataract was not related to any treatment, because sometimes the complicated, the cataract is the result of the steroids. But that happened before she was diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So this was a cataract that was the result of a chronic inflammatory reaction that she had. She developed, she's a girl, and she developed uh, uh, the uh, inflammation very early on in life, before she was six probably. And when you have all these red flags, that makes you very cautious with an IOL implantation. Uh, she's an oligoarticular uh, patient as well. But if that patient had been older, had she been a polyarticular patient that had only a mild uh, inflammatory uh, uveitis, and more uh, uh, joint inflammation, then I might uh, consider under uh, uh, supervision with the uh, uh, pediatric rheumatology and uh, uveitis specialist to implant an IOL for her. Uh, but in most cases, I think it is safer to do the cataract surgery, test the waters with, the, with that, and test the eye's reaction, the reaction of the eye to the surgery, defer the IOL uh, until six uh, months to an, a year later, especially since this patient was also bilateral. So there was no real need to implant an IOL. She's not uh, a unilateral case. Um, there's also, uh, um, how can I avoid ending up with this? First of all, you have to really justify why you're doing the cataract surgery for them. So if my cutoff vision for doing a, uh, uh, for performing cataract surgery in a child is uh, 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 vision here, it would be much lower. Uh, this patient would have to have really poor vision for me to do a cataract. And a lot of them, some, um, even if the cataract looks really bad, they still have reasonable uh, vision. Uh, so um, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't rush into cataract surgery uh, for uh, GIA patients. The patient has to be completely in remission for at least three months. And uh, you have to work very closely with the uveitis specialist, uh, with steroids topically, immune suppression, and adalimumab uh, biologic agents. And as I, as I said again, choose the right candidate for the right procedure. Um, if we can go on. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, to prepare the patient for the surgery, which I really did not want to do because it looked like it was going to be a, a difficult uh, procedure. I upped the meds uh, after consulting the uh, uveitis specialist. We increased the topical steroids. Um, and I gave her a subtenon triamcinolone injection a week before. And we scheduled the surgery to be right after her uh, Humira injection. Now, the difficulties in this procedure, in this cataract surgery, is the fact that uh, you don't want to instigate a lot of inflammation, so you want you don't want to uh, uh, to be too traumatic with your surgery. Um, you don't know where the haptics are because the lower hapt haptic is actually incarcerated in iris tissue. It's not behind uh, the iris; it's in iris tissue. So I was really worried about um, instigating uh, a hemorrhage, a severe hemorrhage from the ciliary body. Uh, by the surgery. So I want I just wanted to get the IOL in out of the eye. And if anybody is looking for a glamorous surgery, this is not it. It's just a say uh, a surgery to get the IOL as safely as possible. I'm I'm sorry that the uh, the movie is not running as fast uh, or as well as I want. So uh, these are the two side ports in incisions and the uh, viscoelastic is then injected in the eye and I'm using the viscoelastic blunt cannula to try to uh, disentangle the IOL from the inflammatory cocoon around it. Uh, and then I'm trying to, uh, uh, I'm using a uh, uh, Vysinski hook to dial the IOL and I'm trying to get it out through the path it went in because I don't want uh, to be uh, pulling on any ciliary uh, uh, process or, or processes or, or any part of the ciliary body. 
Uh, now, this is the uh, corneal, uh, uh, clear, clear corneal incision, and uh, 23 gauge vitreous forceps are used to support the IOL and hold it in place, while the vanus uh, scissors cut uh, the IOL in, uh, I'm not cutting it completely in half, I'm just creating a cut uh, involving half the diameter of the optic. Uh, I've exteriorized uh, one of the uh, haptics and then I'm using McPherson uh, forceps to cartwheel the uh, IOL out of the eye slowly. It's, it's really done very slowly. And now I'm left with the uh, inflammatory membrane and the pupillary membrane, which is very dense. I'm trying to create an edge here in the uh, 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 membrane. Uh, and then I'm using uh, scissors. Uh, to cut the, uh, the membrane. Uh, in opening membranes, I prefer using an insulin needle, a uh, 20 gauge needle on viscoelastic to, to better create cleavage and open planes up. Uh, the beauty about having the viscoelastic is that if any bleeding starts, you can inject viscoelastic right away to tamponade the blood. This is the membrane and the scissors being used to remove it. So after uh, I completely remove the membrane, I want to do an iridectomy here because I'm worried about an, another inflammatory reaction and uh, a glaucoma. Uh, this is an anterior vitrectomy with a 23G probe and I'm very happy that I'm, having, I'm getting a really nice red reflex. I'm also going to use the 23G probe to ensure that I have a, a full thickness iridectomy. Uh, all my incisions are closed and I'm injecting a triamcinolone, four milligrams in the vitreous cavity. And also I'm injecting subtenone, uh, triamcinolone, as well as atropine. So this is the surgery. This is two days post-op. Uh, I only did this case uh, a week ago. You can see that there is a mild inflammatory reaction, which is what we expect. But uh, you can see also the slit beam um, uh, eye, uh, image of the eye, which is fine. So, uh, in primary IOL implantation in cases with juvenile idiopathic arthritis, it's imperative that you get the IOL in the bag. If you're not going to get it in the bag, you might as well not put the, the IOL because you don't want the optic uh, to be chaffing against the back of the iris and creating the chronic inflammation. Uh, the difficulties with the implantation is you have a poorly dilatable pupil. What, what you can do is uh, mechanically dilate the pupil, uh, as you see in the picture. Uh, it's important to uh, use capsular staining to be able to visual, enhance your visualization of the capsule. But the important thing here, or the difficulty, the real difficulty I find, is that the texture of the anterior capsule is very different from what we know. The capsule is very thin. It shreds very easily because of, it, of the inflammatory reaction uh, that it had sustained. So it's, it's, not as, it's not easy to get a good uh, capsular excess on these patients. After, if you do have an intact rexus and you put the IOL in the bag, you should go uh, through the pars plicata to do a central posterior capsulectomy and tear vitrectomy and again inject the uh, uh, triamcinolone. Um, now, uh, this is the second poll. Dina, would you like to? Uh, uh... Yes, so management options in this case are removal of the pupillary membrane and repositioning of the IOL, explantation of the IOL, exchange of the IOL, or surgery should not be attempted. So actually, in this case, I was hoping that surgery would not be attempted. And this is why I was hoping that by upping her medications, we would be able to uh, avoid going to surgery. Um, Seems that this was inevitable. But such a wonderful necessary. surgery. Very challenging indeed. Okay. So yes, great. So yes, in, in cases like that where you have the um, uh, optic or the IOL actually chaffing against the iris all the time, and you have a chronic inflammation that you really can't uh, suppress completely, the only thing to do would be to, uh, to explant the IOL. Um, uh, so, uh, Dr. Yeah, Mustafa, yeah. Would, would you have done the same? 
Yes, of course, if I can, yes. <laughs> Very <laughs> nice. Yes, I, I do the same exactly. You know, okay. especially when she said, we cannot monitor this case. I mean, if sometimes if you feel that you can monitor such a case with treatment and you can avoid interfering, of course you can do this. But I mean, in this type of situation that you had, there is no option. You have to explain the IOL, yes. Okay. And Dr. Hanna, what about the other eye now? What's the time interval to consider removing the cataract of the IOL, uh, the cataract? And then what about the IOL implantation of the other eye as well? Thank you for the question. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, actually, I'm going to uh, uh, keep an eye on the, uh, on the eye that's been uh, recently operated and uh, just make sure that uh, um, um, there is no uh, uh, inflammatory reaction. Once the uh, inflammatory reaction has subsided, uh, and I would give it, give it at least three months uh, before I attempt to do surgery on the other eye. And, and, and when I do the other eye, I will uh, uh, just do a simple uh, pars plicata lensectomy and tear vitrectomy with the uh, triamcinolone. I, I don't want to go through the anterior chamber again. I'd rather uh, not, not, not manipulate uh, the iris uh, a lot. So okay. uh, that would be my, my way to go. And do you think there are specific type of IOLs that induce less reaction than others? Dr. Mustafa, what's your preferred type of IOL if you consider a secondary implantation in those cases? Well, uh, of course, Yanni, as Dr. Hella mentioned, you know, you know, you have to be in the bag. I mean, this is the most important part of the situation. I mean, a long time ago, you are using some type of heparin coated or something like this. But yes. I mean, with the new types of IOL, I think I like the three piece. I mean, I like the three piece and put it in the bag. Uh, uh, why the three piece? It's easy to manipulate if anything happened, it's easy to explain. I mean, rather than one piece that normally sort of amalgamate with the capsule and the, the tissues, I think, yes, I, I will do it in the bag. I'll do it carefully and do all the precautions I can and wait, as Dr. Hella said, in even such a case, even if it's quiet and wait for six months or one year out to okay. implant. I actually think that the lens is, that what you said about the lens is perfectly true. Had this lens been a single piece IOL, I'm pretty sure I would not have been able to uh, get the haptics out. I would probably have ended up by amputating the, uh, the, uh, the haptics and leaving them in place. Uh, so a three-piece IOL is the, is the best uh, choice here, a hydrophobic uh, uh, three, uh, acrylic three-piece IOL. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you see, in, in the midst of all this inflammation, it was easy to uh, uh, dial it out through the, the track that it already, that the haptics already created. So, uh, okay. yes. And there's a question from the audience. You prefer to remove this membrane using the micro gauge instruments rather than using the vitrectomy cutter? Uh, yes, I do. Any reason uh, for that? Uh, because sometimes, even though when we're using the 23G um, uh, forceps, you can inadvertently injure the iris. And uh, I would rather use something that I am, uh, I'm, I'm, whole, I'm trying to create a cleavage uh, plane, whether you do that with scissors or uh, as I prefer with the, uh, the side uh, uh, of the insulin needle, the sharp side of the insulin needle. And uh, that dissects planes for you. But uh, the vitreous cutter sometimes would not dissect a plane, and you would, it would be cutting the membrane, cutting the adhesions, but it may cut part of the iris with it. Okay. So that's why. Okay. And In I'm such cases, the, sorry. Yes. Yes, go on, Dr. Hess. I wanted to know if Dr. Mohammed said it would like to comment on, uh, on this case, if, he, if he's with us, if he's still with us. I don't think, yes, no, Dr. Not? Muhammad okay. is here. No, he's here. Okay, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, this is a very interesting case, actually. And um, well, every case has to be mo monitored uh, according to the situation. Uh, whether to implant or not to implant depends on the severity of the condition. The severity of the condition is related to the control of the uveitis 
you can if you can control the uveitis by the uh, uh, um, moderate medications then this is what i call a simple condition if you cannot control the uveitis except by extreme medication then this is a difficult condition if the difficult condition i leave the patient affected i would rather leave the patient the, to be corrected by glasses effect and not to implant an intraocular lens but if the condition is controllable easily or uh, uh, moderately by medication by uh, an average dose of steroids and immunosuppressives then i would go for intraocular lens implantation Intraocular lens implantation after six months is going to be very difficult because the capsule is going to be collapsed and uh, the synechia is going to obstruct the sulcus even. So you will end up by no sulcus and no uh, uh, capsular back to implant inside. So it's either you implant primarily or you don't implant at all but after six months of chronic uveitis don't expect to find a suitable bed for implantation uh, uh, it will be difficult it will need manipulations and the more you manipulate in those cases the more you get a post-operative inflammation i like very much the delicate touches of uh, dr hala in dealing with the case and the message or the take-home message from her video is that you have to be quick when you are dealing with a case like this and uh, at the same time you have to use the most delicate instruments and the most delicate manipulation in order to prevent the release of the mediators and the uh, 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 inflammatory factors that can result in uh, a post-operative inflammation but in, in total, I do agree with her procedure, and I think it was an, uh, uh, an excellent one. Thank you. Uh, Dina, can I just go back to the question about using the vitreous cutter to remove the pupillary membrane? Um, what, what I meant to say is, uh, first of all, you need, again, to create a plane of cleavage between the membrane and the iris. But once, once you've done that, then definitely, certainly, you can remove the central part of the membrane using a vitreous cutter. It's just that the edges is what I worry about. And, uh, uh, and again, creating just a, a good plane of cleavage between the membrane and the surface of the iris. And uh, I agree with Dr. Mohammed that uh, after uh, leaving the patient aphecic, if there is a severe inflammatory reaction that has closed up the sulcus, then there is no reason to go back and try to implant. But if the patient had uh, uh, a reasonable uh, uh, post-op uh, outcome with, with little inflammation uh, and, and uh, an open sulcus, then I would go back and implant an IOL. And in that case, I would attempt to put the optic incarcerated in the, in the, uh, in the capsular opening that I have uh, to keep it as far away from the uh, iris, the surface of the iris as possible. Thank you. Yeah, your sound, so, Dina, your, uh, your mic. so doing an optic capture then, Dr. Hela? Yes, you mean? I would try to do that. I would attempt to do that. Have you ever managed to put the IOL in the back in case of secondary implantation after six months? Not, said, not just in a uveitis case, or in general, in a pediatric case. Okay, now, now that's interesting because I used to try to do that, but in order uh, to do that, you have to leave uh, in your primary procedure a little bit of cortex between the anterior and posterior capsule so that they don't uh, uh, fix together, so that they're not amalgamated together. Mm -hmm. And when I did that in an attempt to leave a donut that I could later open, I got a lot of uh, um, pupillary membranes or secondary membranes because I left the cortex. So. Um, if I, if, if I do a really good cleanup, then I can't open uh, the leaflets and I don't implant in the back uh, and I do a sulcus implant. Uh, sometimes if I, I get cases where 
uh, I do have uh, quite a bit of a donut and when I'm able to open that donut well and remove the cortex, then I can implant the IOL in the okay. bank. Dr. Ayman, I'm certain there are lots of, squ of questions from the audience, right? I'm trying to collect the question from, a lot of questions from the audience, and, but some of them have been already answered during, the, during this interesting discussion. I have a couple of questions from uh, Dr. Jamal Blake. I would like to welcome him, him for this question. Uh, first, he showed his opinion about uh, that if you have an, uh, a reaction uh, preoperatively, he, he, he recommend putting topical drops, topical, uh, topical, uh, topical uh, and steroid drops, and never implant IOL uh, if you have reaction uh, preoperatively, and then uh, putting, uh, if, if you are going to, to put IOL to be only uh, in the bag. This is also his first comment. The second comment is about the posterior, uh, this question for in the posterior capsulotomy. Would you do posterior capsulotomy in such case of uveitis to which age? Do we do it regularly as we do in, uh, in regular pediatric uh, cataract uh, uh, surgeries or you recommend to extend the, uh, the age or decrease? So actually uh, in, um, in a uveitis uh, patient, I would uh, do the posterior capsulotomy uh, up to the age of 10. Whereas in, uh, in other, uh, in pediatric cases, I would uh, uh, stop doing it between six and eight, depending on if the patient is cooperative enough to sit uh, for EAC, for example. Okay, uh, one more question uh, has been asked about, um, do, would you consider uh, giving prophylactic anti-glaucoma because uh, are we expecting to having post-operative rise in intraocular pressure, will you do it prophylactically or you don't do this? Uh, it. It's very difficult to expect anything with this patient. You cannot expect because the pressure can go up, but also because of the chronic inflammation, uh, the pressure may be very low. Uh, so, uh, in, like in this case, she had an intraocular pressure of 10, and that worries me. Uh, to have an intraocular pressure of 10 millimeters mercury when you have an iris bomb bay and a pupillary block tends to tell me that her ciliary body is not producing a lot of acres. So uh, um, you don't know which way it will go. So I wouldn't give it prophylactically. I would give it if it rises. OK. okay. So, uh, so I think we have to conclude for this nice, interesting case. Thank you, Dr. Hela, and thank, thank you. you for the rich thank discussion. You. And we go forward to the last case. Claudina, please let's, let's start your yes. dialogue. Now the screen should be shared, right? Yes, it is. Okay. Very interesting case. Okay. So, my case is a six year old boy with a history of dog bite at the age of two uh, and a, lift, a left upper lid repaired wound. His, here's his cycloplegic refraction showing an isometropic cylinder and his amblyope in this left eye having a best corrected vision of 0.2. And the parents came complaining of outward deviation of the left eye started one year after the accident. So here are the preoperative pictures of the boy showing the left exotropia with a small hypotropia and he had a significant V pattern with a large upgaze exotropia and a bilateral inferior oblique overaction more evident in the right eye. He had a significant limitation in elevation both in midline and in abduction with what seemed like a bilateral superior oblique underaction on both sides. The boy had a positive head tilt test. On the right head tilt, he had the same angle of a small left hypotropia as the primary position. But on the left head tilt, he showed the left hypertropia of 16 prism diopters. And he had an objective fundus extorsion in both eyes, extortion more in the right eye. Here are his measurements. The primary position, he had a 35 prison diopter exotropia for near, 40 prison diopters for distance, increasing to 70 prison diopters in up gaze. In the right gaze, he had a left hypertropia of 20 prison diopters, and in the right, in the left gaze, he had a right hypertropia of 35 prison, uh, prison diopters, along with the 
vertical deviations, the right uh, hypertrophia of eight present diopters increasing to 16 on left head tilt. The CT of the child showed here, as seen in the axial and the coronal images, a calcified trochlea, but the comment came also, it could be a suspected foreign body. So here's my first question. What do you think might be the cause of limited elevation in this case? Superior rectus injury, inferior rectus tightness, superior adhesions from the previous dog bite or the suspected foreign body. Okay, so I can see that most chose that the superior adhesions are the cause. So again, to our case and our panelists, Dr. Amr, what do you think of this case? You know, usually with um, trauma, you don't think much. Everything is possible. So, um, I think we go for surgery with uh, an open mind and uh, you do a force reduction test and, uh, and you decide intraoperative. Uh, there is no manual for the glaucoma, for, for the trauma. There is no, there's no way to go. There is no pre-planning for this. It all depends what you're going to find inside the surgery. But yes, it sounds like it's possible that uh, some fibrosis on the, of course, the superior side of the globe where the injury was, it was causing this limitation, yeah. Okay. And Dr. Hela? What do you think? Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I agree with Dr. Amr. Uh, that, well, you have to plan the surgery though. Uh, and and I, I'll leave you to show, to show the plan because it's something that we did together. So okay. I, I, I won't comment. Okay, Dr. Oskan, I want to ask you about this li limited elevation along with the extortion he has on both sides and the positive head tilt test. Well, uh, well, this patient, I, I think obviously had components of both a paralytic problem and an adherence problem. But uh, for, uh, I would definitely ask for an MRI preoperatively for this patient. But okay. uh, it seems to me that this patient, despite he had the foreign body and adherence problems as well, uh, despite the positive Bischofsky head tilt test, he had some paresis in the left superior rectus muscle and the secondary overaction of the inferior rectus muscle uh, led us to see the, uh, as the right superior oblique is underacting and because of the limitation of elevation, especially more on abduction, the Inferior oblique overaction is a, also secondary to this limitation. So, uh, but at the end, uh, what would well, be your surgical plan? What would you start with? Well, considering the surgical plan, my choice would be uh, first of all, uh, as I said, I, I must see the MRI first. Mm -hmm. But uh, and if, if we don't have the MRI, what I we would suggest for this patient is, first of all, he is six years old. Before surgery, I would give chance for amblyopia therapy because any increase in uh, visual acuity would lead the exotropia to decrease significantly in that case. And for on eight months, hand, he was very resistant to amblyopia therapy. We tried it for eight months with intensive uh, part-time occlusion and he did not respond point to what the, was the best vision he could achieve. Okay, so uh, in such a condition, what we need to do is to treat the, uh, the squint that the patient have, mm -hmm. not the original problem itself. So I would suggest for this patient that if I'm going to, first of all, I need to correct the exo deviation, I need to correct the hypo, and I also need to correct the V pattern. So this is not a binocular patient. So what I would do in this patient is 
to uh, make a recess resect in the left eye, as well as supraplace both of them, one tendon width, and do an inferior uh, oblique disinsertion in both eyes. Inferior oblique disinsertion, disinsertion. bilateral. Okay. And in the left eye, recess resect uh, plus uh, supra placement of uh, uh, um, uh, of the of both eyes. So one tendon width of the both of the uh, horizontal muscles. Okay. So this would correct the uh, hypotropia, and this would also eliminate the V pattern. And uh, so I think it would uh, also help for the limitation of abduction. But of course, uh, the results of first action and so on, it's, it's all it. But the adherence problems, as long as you operate the areas of adherence, you create new uh, problems. Okay. So here is what ha has been done. There's just a short video, just for the first part of the surgery. We started by marking the six and 12 o'clock positions and by the force duction test, which was positive for tightness for both infraducting and supraducting the globe and extremely positive for the superior oblique or the upper nasal quadrant and free for the inferior oblique. The plan was to initially explore the, both the superior and the uh, rectus and the superior oblique, and uh, exploring the superior oblique tendon after identifying it and hooking it from the temporal side to avoid the area of adhesions at the upper nasal part, which were really extensive. There was also the suspicion that the superior rectus might be injured, but it was intact. And here I'm just showing how to hook the superior oblique tendon from underneath the superior rectus by just replacing the belly of the superior rectus a bit nasal. You can identify the beginning of the fanning of the fibers of the superior oblique and hooking it, making sure you identified the tendon and that it did not miss any posterior fibers of the tendon like shown here. So we want to secure our tendon by passing uh, six ovicral sutures or any suture material underneath the tendon and just simply by getting it from the nasal side of the superior rectus now we have the tendon identified, secured. The video stopped? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll just make it here. And also the superior oblique tendon was intact, wasn't injured, but there were extensive adhesions extending posteriorly here. And as much as we could, we severed those adhesions. And the more those adhesions were released, the more the globe got free. So the plan was yet, yet now to repeat our force duction test and see what's going on. And fortunate enough, the globe was relatively free with free introduction, supraduction, just a very bloody field though. <laughs> So what happened now, we examined the fundus prior to the surgery and the, the extortion, although it's more difficult or it's not, uh, to, you can, we can judge it under GA as uh, when the patient is awake, but the extortion was significantly exaggerated after releasing those adhesions. So at this point, would you consider the following to correct the objective fundus extortion we are already seeing? Left superior oblique tucking, left inferior oblique weakening. You do both or you just ignore this extortion and just do the recess resect to correct the exotropia.
I was fortunate enough in this surgery to be assisted by Dr. Assisted by Dr. Hala herself. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. So left inferior oblique weakening. Gina, this child did not have any binocularity to start with, right? Yeah, he's not fusing. So what we've done is graded anteriorization of the inferior oblique, one millimeter from the inferior rectus, along with the lateral rectus recession and the medial rectus resection without any transposition. And here are the post-operative pictures of the child. He was perfectly aligned in the primary position with still the significant limitation not improving, whether in the midline or in the abduction, but there's a considerable correction of his V pattern. And as you can see, the overaction of the inferior rectus was corrected here, along with the inferior oblique overaction and superior oblique underaction in this eye or the other as well. And here are his post-operative measurements compared to the pre-operative measurements written here in red. He was just having this small ET in down gaze with the plus one inferior oblique over action in his right eye, the left gaze, and the uh, XT in the up gaze of 25 uh, prism diopters as compared to 70 prism diopters prior to the surgery. So, Dr. Austin, have you got an explanation of the correction of those gazes, but still the limitation is still the same? So, uh, you, enter, you performed an inferior oblique anterior position of the left eye, is yes. that right? Yes, yes. Okay. Without any, anything on the right eye. Well, uh, I think... Uh, Considering the limitation of elevation, this is not a satisfactory result. For the rest exactly. of it, it's okay. And I, I still believe that it is because that your, the left superior rectus muscle is not functioning well. As, uh, so when uh, this, uh, there is a paresis in the superior rectus muscle, then as it is an intorter at the, uh, on, the, on the other hand, so the amount of extortion related to the uh, superior oblique palsy is more exaggerated. So uh, if you would uh, do the transposition surgery that I recommended, you would have a better elevation. And if you would do this bilateral inferior oblique weakening uh, on up case, you would have a more uh, symmetrical result. And this is uh, what I suggest. I think in an eye, in a, uh, I would actually personally would never do an anterior position surgery in a child who already had a limitation of elevation, despite it is more prominent on the abduction. So, uh, so the, uh, the, the problem is to have a, a, a symmetry in both eyes. So in that case, this asymmetry on up gaze increased despite the v pattern is not there the exo deviation is not there okay but now he had more asymmetry considering the vertical deviation on up case okay this is what i suggest so do you think if we had an upward transposition of the medial and lateral recti would this have ended him in a hypertropia in the primary position uh i don't think so because on the other hand, uh, I would do uh, this insertion of the, uh, in, uh, you, you ask whether it would cause a hyper? I mean, because if you already do. had a hypo preoperatively. So this is yes. what, what we want to treat. So we want to elevate this eye. And uh, on the other hand, we have this V pattern phenomenon. So, uh, so we, we would de decrease the left eye um, over elevation by disinserting that. 
and it would be enough to correct the hypotropia uh, uh, a full tandem with uh, transposition uh, parallel to the spiral of TO. Okay, Dr. Akmal, yes. how do you think that he ended up having a vertical orthotropia while we weakened the inferior oblique, which is an, ele an elevator at the end? I have no yes. explanation, but do you have one? Yes, the, the dog bite was in the left eye. Yes. yes. So it's uh, like a, some sort of canine tooth. This is what I wanted to suggest, but can we say it's a canine tooth where there is a limitation predominantly in adduction in cases described as a canine tooth syndrome? He doesn't have a limitation of it's elevation not, in adduction, so yes, not a classic yes, one though. Not a classic, classic one. But if I will touch this patient, I will do for both bilateral inferior oblique disinsertion. Because okay, like Dr. Ostan said. The lead pattern is not correct. It's uh, 25 prism up and 8 ET down. Why don't you touch the left? The, sorry, the right inferior oblique. Why did we do the right inferior oblique in the first place? Why didn't yes. we do it? We didn't. Yes, we did. Actually, our plan was to start with the left eye because the parents were very disencouraged. Okay. to operate on the right one because of this is yes, the seeing are. eye. Okay. And <laughs> Amr, do you have any comment? I, um, I, think, um, I think I'm looking now at the, the picture you're showing is a picture of an anti-elevation syndrome. And, um, I, and one of the audience suggested that you just created an anti-elevation syndrome and that's what I see now. Um, I'm not really sure if um, you really needed to do anything in the, in the oblique or is it, was it really useful in this uh, situation? Uh, once you release the restriction, uh, you may have ended up with a with a, with a different picture. And uh, next thing is, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is the, the intraoperative assessment of the ex excitotorsion torsion and making decisions based on that sometimes can be very uh, misleading. Um, of course, you don't have a fusing patient, so you may not want to correct the excitotorsion torsion much. You use that, I assume you use that to, to know if the inferior oblique is going to be overacting, so you can use this to correct the hypertropia. Um, I did, um, I did a simple experiment once of trying to uh, kind of a blind experiment to assess the extortion before and after regular inferior oblique myectomies. And it was very difficult to, to see it, even though I just did an inferior oblique myectomy. Um, so I think yeah, I'm not sure if the inferior oblique did much in this case. I think okay. releasing the adhesions did, the, did most of the job. Okay, Dr. Hala? Okay, I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, to just uh, comment here that once we released the adhesions, so the adhesions were like creating a tether in that eye and the tether made the, this eye hypotropic. But once we released the adhesions, what we thought was that we would be ending up with the superior oblique palsy and that we were actually going to make uh, 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 the superior oblique palsy now become more apparent. Uh, and this is what led us to, uh, uh, and, and, and that, became uh, evident to us by the more exo ex extortion that appeared in the fundus and in the rotation of the of our marks. But, but, but why anteriorization? Why doing an anteriorization? Why not a myectomy or recession? Uh, actually, what the anteriorization that we did is not a true anteriorization. So what we did was we put the inferior rectus, the anterior pole, one millimeter behind the temporal border of the inferior rectus and the other pole even behind that. So it wasn't uh, creating a J deformity in any way. It's, uh, we call that an anteriorization, but actually it's not, uh, it, it, it doesn't, it, normally that wouldn't create an anti-elevation uh, in that patient. No, 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 my question is why, why, not a, why not a recession or myectomy? Why, why did you think of this? modified anterization, if you would like to call it. Because um, it worked, uh, yeah, I use that when I have superior oblique palsy in one eye. I never anteriorize so that I'm level with the inferior rectus or, or anterior to it, but I go behind it and I always put my posterior pole of the muscle even behind the anterior pole. And that works really well. It's, it's a, it is a form of a recession. It's just a little bit more than a recession. 
Okay, so it's, it's like this is your routine procedure in cases of superior, simple superior oblique palsy? Yes, that's what I do. I, 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 uh, well, it depends. Actually, no, I wouldn't say that. I, it depends on how much hypertrophy I would have in the primary position with the superior oblique palsy. But I can go up to one millimeter uh, behind the inferior rectus to get an effect of, uh, of an improvement maybe of uh, 15 to 16 prism diopters of, uh, of hypertrophy. And okay, I don't, so I don't get a J deformity with that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Oskan, I want to, to, to say a comment before you, you say it's, you had an article about the leash and the reverse leash phenomena, but just in post-operative cases. So what we thought of is that this case, what caused the hypotropia is the reverse leash. And by severing those adhesions, this, we, we uh, just, this leash is no more, no longer there. And the elevation or the anti-elevation is present here. It's just not induced because this is exactly the picture the child had preoperatively. Actually, his elevation even improved a bit, but not as much as we hoped for. So, actually, what what I would like to say is that I think that the a lot of the adhesions recurred, where after they were severed. And I think I remember that after the surgery, he had a bit of a hematoma in the eye. And uh, that made, made, made me pessimistic about the fact that the adhesions would not return in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dr. Austin, yeah. you had something yeah. to say? Considering the uh, leash, this uh, leash and reverse leash uh, phenomenon was described by many years ago by Jan Jampolsky. It is, uh, so in this child, it, is, uh, it also plays a role, but the, the thing is, once these adhesions develop, and uh, especially in the posterior part, if there is any disturbance of the orbital fat or so on, whatever you release during the operation, afterwards it will um, the adhesions recur. So <clears throat> in this child, I think those ad adhesions uh, mask some of the problems, and when you release the adhesions during surgery, you see, uh, because of those additions, the paresis in the superior rectus muscle was not so uh, apparent. But when you release yes. those additions, then the, uh, with the less intortion effect of superior rectus muscle, then you saw an increase in extortion. This is my explanation why when you release those uh, additions, you saw an increase in extortion because uh, it was actually the fact. If you uh, but of course, this is something so variable that you cannot know how those additions, sometimes these, uh, some of those additions may uh, mask some of the uh, major problems. Some, sometimes they may, um, they may uh, become some kind of advantage for uh, masking some of the problems. I think this was the case uh, in this patient. Yes. And, uh, and uh, the, I would like to comment on anterior positioning of inferior oblique muscle. I, uh, I also do a similar type of anterior position uh, frequently, but I must say that it is obviously, although uh, its effect is not as much as suturing the posterior fibers at the same level of the anterior fibers. It is, uh, uh, it is the, its effect is different than making a disinsertion or a myectomy, which is, it is in a much more anterior location. So in a patient already who already had a limitation of elevation, I think it certainly added more for uh, the limitation of uh, elevation here. And I would like to ask you, uh, what do you consider as further operation in this child? And uh, if you would like, I can say my command. <laughs> I wanted to ask you this question. Actually, that was the ne my next question. Well, uh, after that stage, it seems that you would have to uh, convince the parents to operate the right eye and to do an inferior orbic disinsertion in the right eye, but now, you need to make a superior rectus fadon in the right eye as well to have uh, some asymmetry because this asymmetry is uh, quite significant. This is what I suggest. Okay. And do you think the presence of bilateral superior oblique palsy in this child he is an independent of the trauma he had? 
because the trauma doesn't explain the classic bilateral superior oblique palsy signs he showed. Yeah, this is something that I commented before. Uh, as this child, so when you have a superior rectus palsy, you have a limitation of elevation. So the eye remains here. So this secondary overaction of the inferior oblique muscle makes the other eye go up. And when you have a, a, a limitation here, you have a secondary overaction in the inferior rectus muscle. And this secondary overaction will let you see that uh, as if this right superior oblique muscle is underacting, but this is actually secondary to, to this, what is happening in the uh, rectus muscle in the left eye. So I, I, my suggestion is the right eye thing is totally secondary to the primary uh, local problem in the left eye. Okay. Dr. Mustafa, you wanted to add a comment, I can see. Um, I just, what, what I wanted to say here, when we saw the case from the start, uh, I don't feel that all what, what in the eyes is only spread of comitance. I feel that he had already something before, such, a, such an XT, a V pattern XT of 70 prism, I doubt it's, it's just the spread of comitance or due to other trauma. I think he had already something and it added on it this type of trauma. And when you deal with this situation, I would have dealt, like Dr. Oskan said, I would have just said, yes, I put lateral and medial for the left eye and then put them up to elevate the eye. And then you have to deal with the V pattern XT as any V pattern XT. I mean, the lateral rectus would be recessed and bilateral and inferior oblique and put them up. I mean, I don't feel that I have to deal part by part. I always, I always like to have the, all the problem try to deal with at the same time because if not, if I do part and then wait for the other, I get another situation in a few months. So I'm going to deal with another, another problem, not the first problem to add some surgery. So as we have here, we have to, to redo something. And I still was going to do what Dr. Oskan said from the start, just go, go again and put the medial and lateral rectus for the left eye up and deal with the inferior oblique recession for the right eye. I think that would be quite satisfactory. Okay. But if we so, do now uh, the elevation of the uh, medial and the lateral recti, the patient is orthotropic in the primary position. So what? No. I don't think it's going to, uh, to end up with hypertrophia left eye, no. Why not? Because it's, it's only a deficient of elevation. It's like double elevator. I mean, you have deficient elevation. So at that time, you always get this slightly up and doesn't get disparity of both sides. Okay. I mean, I, I don't see it. So now, any questions, Dr. Ayman, from the audience that haven't been, I see the discussion is here. It took a long time and we're running out of time. It, yes, We're actually it, beyond it, time already. Questions from the from the audience, but let me ask you so one question: is asking about again the force reduction test. You mentioned in the surgery that was some limitation in elevation. I mean, is this elevation? Right? Yes, and that the, the question is why don't we you offer inferior rectus recession uh, to uh, to maybe because this kind of of uh, restriction and can improve this hypo and it may improve the elevation. It was indeed an option, but the, we thought it's a reverse leash rather than the inferior rectus itself is tight. So like releasing those adhesions might do a better job than leaving them and going for the inferior rectus recession. Anything okay. to add, Dr. Yeah, Hala? One question, ask about the foreign body. Explore searching for a foreign body. And another question related that uh, this, the MRI show, uh, 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 before, before actually the MRI, there was suspicion of having a, a foreign body. So, uh, you had any fear of doing the MRI, uh, expecting this foreign body could be, uh, have anything that happened? Actually, we, we, the, the report stated that it might be a foreign body, but it's uh, actually the uh, calcified trochlea. I don't know if I can get back, but it's in the, 
we, they call it the bone window scans of the CT showed that this uh, part is faint. It doesn't have this uh, intensity of the foreign body. So it was more likely to be a calcified trochlea. And this was the case. It wasn't. And we could actually palpate this trochlea and nodule. It was apparent on, uh, in this boy. The last question about uh, to avoid the recurrence of fibrosis. Uh, some some uh, ODS uh, uh, suggested mitomycin or amniotic membrane. Would you consider this in such patients? It is an option, correct, but we, we did not do it. May I comment? Yes. Uh, just as you talk about mitomycin, in any strabismus surgery, and uh, considering about mitomycin is something, um, it's, it's a concerning agent because it reduces the um, wound healing reaction. So when we suture the muscles, we need wound healing. So if you stop this, you may end up with slipping muscles and because your muscle will not adhere as you expect, as you expect. Okay. Yeah, I just so, wanted very quickly to, uh, to comment that I do agree with Dr. Oskan that everything that is going on in the right eye is not uh, a primary deviation, but it's secondary to what is going on in the left eye. But that also includes even the extortion that you saw in the fundus. It's when it's it's like a secondary type of deviation because when the patient uh, is trying to uh, to fix with the paralyzed eye, the uh, the other eye will will not the 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 eye with the uh, with the problem. When he tries to fix with that, the other eye will show the extortion, and that also sometimes. Uh, gives people the impression that there is a bilateral fourth nerve palsy when it really isn't. So depending on extortion alone, it's, it's, it's again a secondary deviation, not a primary. Okay. So, so yes, Dr. Ahmed? Yes, I want to support the, uh, the, the Dr. Mustafa Sherbini. I think uh, the patient has long said something before the trauma because the V pattern is very high. And the uh, preoperative 70 present diopter up, I think it is the V pattern exotropia. On top, uh, she got a trauma. I think so. I support Dr. Mustafa for that. Okay. This is the last comment. Okay. okay. So I think so I we think have to conclude now. And it's been two hours. We're sorry for our audience and for you keeping you late. And Dr. Ayman, can you just announce our next webinar? Yes, we announced that this is the, just the first webinar and we are planning to uh, have a weekly um, uh, web webinar at the same time that for the coming uh, two weeks. And uh, um, I wish the, uh, we receive uh, the same kind of audience or even more. And uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Scan for being with us in the, our first uh, uh, webinar and please be safe and I'd like to thank uh, all the, uh, pan the panelists and of course I'd like to thank Eva Pharma for supporting uh, this and uh, lastly I'd like to thank all the audience for staying with us for uh, more than two hours now. Thank you, Dr. Hala. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dr. Oskan. Dr. Mustafa. Thank you, Dr. Am. And thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Eva. See you Parma. next week. And, uh, yeah. In our See next you. And Ramadan Karim. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Have a great night. Bye. 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 Thank you.